Welcome to Miracles Now. I'm Brian Bolt. God does miracles now. We serve a great God. We serve a big God. We serve a God of the supernatural. I'm so excited what God is doing. I believe God is going to speak to you today. I want you to check out our website at Brian Bolt World Evangelism as it pops up on the screen here. Check out everything we do. We're looking for prayer partners. We're looking for people that will support us monthly. And as you get ready to watch this message, I believe the Holy Spirit's going to speak to your heart. Everything's going to change. God's going to do a new thing. The power of God is going to move through your life. The healing virtue of Jesus. God is a God of the supernatural. He's a miracle working God. As you prepare to receive everything God has for you, open your heart, open your mind. Say, God, I'm ready. I want everything you have for me. I believe today is a new day, a fresh anointing, a new season. The power of God manifested in the anointing of Jesus. Get ready. Get ready, get ready for what God's going to do. God bless you. I'm very excited about how God is moving all through our discipleship, all through our services, everything. It's a powerful season. But if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 16. Now he's going to read just a few scriptures here. I've preached this so many times. But she's going to read verses 19 through 31. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through one, though one rise from the dead. Lift your hands where you're at. Now they're just going to bless each person here. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your word. We thank you for open hearts. And we ask that this word falls heavy upon every heart in the room. And the seed of this word will multiply for your glory and for the sake of eternity in Jesus' name. Come on, give Jesus a hallelujah and amen, a hand clap. I... I'm so excited what God is doing all through the church, and I'm so excited to see the movement and the great growth that is happening here in so many different areas. Now, as I get ready to preach this message, I am not naive to the fact or unrealistic to think that everybody in this room, in this tabernacle, or watching online, or watching through TV is going to heaven. I realize that there's some people in the room that are going to hell. And I realize there's people that are watching online that are going to hell. And with the greatest humility and with a heart towards God, I want to preach a message titled, Your First Moments in Hell. It'd be unrealistic are naive to think even through the teachings of Jesus that everybody gathered in this tabernacle is going to heaven. 
It'd be unrealistic. It would not line up with the teachings of Christ to think that everybody in this room watching online, watching through TV, watching through streaming, that everyone watching is going to heaven. I know that you've gone to funerals and every funeral you've ever been to, everybody's going to heaven. That is not true. That is a lie. I'm here to tell you, Jesus teaches quite the opposite. And I preach this message because some people will go to hell. And I want you to know, when you get there, the moment you get there, what you will experience, what to expect. For the people that will end up in hell, I want you to understand what you are walking into, what you can expect. I understand that some people in this room, it's more likely that you will go to hell than go to Paris, France. It's more likely you will go to hell than go to Chennai, India. It's more likely you will go to hell than go to New York City. And I wanna say the first three things that will happen to each one of us that are in the sound of my voice. It will happen to everyone that is breathing and everyone that is alive. The very first thing is each and every one of us are going to die. I know this isn't an amen, hallelujah type message. I don't know if even it's an organ type message tonight, but I'm here to tell you, I'm not expecting amens and I'm not expecting shouts and I'm not expecting hallelujahs. I just got to deliver the word I believe God wants me to deliver. And I'm here to tell everyone, Hebrews 9 verse 27, and it says, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. <laughs> You will not be reincarnated. You will not come back as a dog, a cat, a cow, a goat. You will not come back as a serpent. You will not come back. Once you die, you die. It's appointed once for a man to die. So I guarantee everyone here will die. And I guarantee that everyone will experience death. And that is a guarantee. We all will die. The second thing we all will experience is judgment. It says, after death comes judgment. You will be judged. After that, everyone that is born again, Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you'll be immediately transported to heaven. If you are not born again and do not have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will be escorted to hell. And I want you to understand what will happen to you. Those very first moments in hell, because there's people in the sound of my voice, you will go to hell. Not everyone will go to heaven. And so you understand that, I want you to know what you're facing. Every time the Bible mentions heaven, one time it mentions hell 10 times. Hell is a real place. It's not a figment of someone's imagination. It's not something we just tell to scare people. It is a real tangible place. And there's people that are watching online. Not everybody's going to heaven. Jesus teaches us that in Matthew 13, 30. He says, let both grow together until the harvest. At the time of the harvest, I'll say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus is giving an example of the kingdom. He says, look, there's going to be people that are gonna be saved, born again, that are gonna to begin to just grow, and right next to those people are gonna be people that are on their way to hell. And there'll come a time when each life is over, and Jesus says, even if the rapture occurs, I'm gonna take the ones, the tares, I'm gonna bind them up and cast them into the fire. And the ones, the wheat, I'm gonna put in my barn. Jesus says in Matthew 13, 47, says again, 
The kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet, a net that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into the vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and separate the wicked from among the just and cast them into the furnace of fire where there'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. There is a separation. There's people you will grow up with. There's people you will love. There's people that you will care deeply about. And they will not go to heaven. No matter how much you want them to go to heaven, they will not go to heaven. If it was just your ability to wish them into heaven, that would be a great thing, but that is not it. They have to make a choice. They have to say, I want Jesus as my Lord and Savior. They must be born again. It's free will God gives each of us. There will even be pastors you knew. There will be worship leaders you knew. There's people that you will listen to on CD or tape or that shows my age a little bit. On the radio, on YouTube, I don't know what people listen to things anymore, but... You'll listen to someone even come to church and that person that you, your favorite Christian song, that person could end up in hell. It's so true and it's so real. The Bible also talks about soil. It says this in Matthew 13, 18. Why don't you read it, Natalie? Natalie. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Even with his teaching, it says three out of four people, three out of four hearts that hear the word will not be fruitful. Seventy-five percent wind up in a place called hell. It would be unrealistic to think that everyone in this room, everyone watching online, is on their way to heaven. No matter how much you shout, no matter how much you cheer, no matter what you do, unless Jesus is your Lord and Savior, unless you are born again, but let me explain your first moments in hell so that you know what to expect. And I want you to understand how you will get there. I think that's very important. You will get there. Angels will escort you to have hell. We can see that in the story of Lazarus that the angels escorted Lazarus to heaven and the man opened his eyes and he was in hell. But we also see in Matthew 22, 11 through 13. I know there's a lot of scripture. That's why this is a teaching. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You will be escorted by angels to hell. It's probably why the Bible says, it makes it so clear because when the Bible says one person, when one sinner who repents, it says the angels rejoice. 
There's great joy, the Bible says. Because imagine the horror of the angels having to escort someone to hell. What they see, what they hear. I imagine the rejoicing would be quite wonderful because they don't have to take someone. They don't have to cast them down. They don't have to drag them into that place. I imagine the rejoicing is quite real. I imagine it's not just because they're going to be in heaven, but they also don't have to drag someone to that horrible, horrific place. I know this isn't popular preaching, and I know this isn't nice, warm, and fuzzy preaching, but I don't know if I would do my job as a pastor if I... Sometimes love is tough love. Sometimes love is saying things exactly what it is. Sometimes if someone does not tell you, how do you know? Sometimes you need to understand how serious the consequences you are that you are making. Some of you are facing choices and consequences that will lead you down a dark road. That will lead you down a road that you cannot come back from. There's many people that grew up in church that will end up in hell. There's many people that sang on this worship team that will end up, not on this worship team, I'm not going to say that. Can I get a loud amen? But there's many people that would be on many worship teams all over the country that would end up in hell. But if they don't understand what they're walking into, if they don't understand what they're facing, I'm not going to teach long. I'm not going to preach long. I just want you to understand that hell is a real place. Just like heaven is real, hell is real. And I know it's so much easier to talk about the good things, and I am a positive person, but if we don't ever say what is real, we have most of the church believe now hell is just a figment of someone's imagination. We believe hell isn't a real place. We believe it's kind of, you know, this cosmic, liter I don't know what the church believes anymore, but I still believe hell is a real place where there's fire, where there's gnashing of teeth, where there, the worm never dies, the Bible says, where the Bible says it's better that you pluck out your eye it's better to lose an eye than go to hell. That's what the Bible says. And I know we don't talk like that anymore because it's not popular. It's not the in thing. And I understand it's not warm and fuzzy. And I know we should be talking about how church hurt you are and how all the problems you have and how we can help you. And I understand that. But if, if we fix all your problems and you're still on your way to hell, what have we done? And if you get healed from church hurt and you still end up in hell, what have we done? There's too many people on their way to hell and there's too many of our children on our way to hell and we don't ever say anything. And I hope this message you'll be able to relate to your family members and friends because the truth can set someone free. And I want you to understand today you'll be escorted by angels. And I imagine when someone does repent, they just rejoice. Not just because they're populating heaven, but they don't have to escort someone to that place. Some of you that are watching online, some of you here in the tabernacle, I hate to say it, but you're going to go to hell unless you make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. No one can talk you out of it. You made up your mind. You live life on your terms. You do what you want. You don't even believe in heaven or hell. What kind of God you said, a love, what kind of loving God would create a hell? What kind of God that's so loving would create a hell, you say? Since you have all the answers and you're smarter than God, 
one day you will spend your first moments in hell. And the first thing you will notice is how homesick you are. Luke 16, verse 27 and 28 from our text. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. The first moments of hell, you'll be so homesick. I don't know if you've ever been homesick as a child or as a little boy or little girl or growing up. I know times where I travel long and I start to get very homesick. I miss my wife. I miss my family. I miss them and my heart gets homesick. And I remember when I was little and I'd stay over for a weekend at a friend's house and eventually I would get homesick for my mother or my father. When you're in hell, the first few moments, your very first few moments, the first thing that will happen to you is that you will be so homesick. This man remembered his family. He said, I have five brothers. You'll be so homesick. You'll, 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 you'll crave just to go back home, just to be in your bed. All the things you complained about, you will just, you will just all want them so much. The thing that was wrong in your house that you complained about for years, that house that was beaten and broke down in the ghetto, you will, you will desire that place. You will desire to go back there. You'll desire to see your family. You'll desire, oh, you'll be so homesick. It'll be a yearning that will be so, it will break you. It'll be such a brokenness to just get back to the place you were. You'll be so broken just to see the family members you couldn't even stand to be around. You're so broken and paralyzed in that moment. If I could just talk to them one more time, if I could just tell them this, if I could just warn them, if I could just say, don't end up in this place, you're so homesick. Nothing will solve it, no matter how much you beg, no matter how much you cry, no matter how much you scream, nothing will solve the homesickness. It'll be so intense, so tormenting. Be so breaking. I'm not talking about going to a place that's just terrible or horrible. I'm not talking about just going to a place that's going to be bad for a little bit of time. I'm not talking about just going to a place where you just got to endure. You just got to make it through a week or two. I'm not talking about a place like that. You could get through that. You could muscle your way through that. This is a place that you're never leaving. This is a place that you're going to be forever and ever and ever. And you'll be so broken just to tell your family. So broken to just tell your children. So broken. I wish I would have done things different. You'll be so broken. So homesick. Those things you used to complain about that your mom did, your father did, your children did. The things that you used to upset you that your aunt or uncle did. Oh, you'll just crave that. If I could just get back there one more time. If I could just get back and do it over. There's no do-overs once you're there. One of the things I enjoy is the outdoors. I love seeing beautiful outdoor scenery. I love even seeing city skylines, and I love seeing so many things like that. I don't know if you've ever seen a sunset or a sunrise. I've seen them in different parts of the world, and I know we have some pictures. There's something so beautiful about a sunrise, something so beautiful about a sunrise over the mountains. Or it's so beautiful to see the sun coming up with the sun setting. People travel to the ocean just to watch the sunset or the sunrise. There's nothing like when you see the sun come up over the ocean and you see the water just 
shimmering. There's nothing like seeing a mountain, a snow-capped mountain, and the snow on top, you can just see it for miles. And it looks so majestic. There's something about seeing a river that just winds for miles and miles and miles down a valley where trees are on the right and trees are on the left. In hell, you will have no view of a sunset. There's no windows in hell. There's no sunsets in hell. There's no sunrises in hell. There's no snow-capped mountains in hell. There's no rivers that wind for miles in hell. There's no scenery in hell that would make you want to get up in the morning. There's fire. There's things you could not even fathom. I pray that God makes this real to you tonight. I pray that God makes this so real to you that it's embedded into your spirit. There's nothing that you'll want to travel to. There's nothing that will make you want to wake up and go see the sunset or the sunrise. Hell is a real place. You will see things that are horrific. You'll see things that you could not fathom here on earth. You'll see things, so much torture, so much pain, so much anguish, so much crying, so much screaming. You will hear sounds that do not make sense in the natural mind. You'll hear sounds that are so they're so crazy, you won't even know what to think. The sounds could drive you almost mad. The sights could almost make a... It's not a snow-capped mountain. It's not a sunrise. It's not a sunset. It's not a city view even. Even the worst ghetto in America, the worst ghetto in the world would look so much better. Some of the worst places you could imagine on planet Earth would look so much better. You would desire to be in the worst ghetto compared to that place. There's no windows there. There's no view. Luke 16, 24. Your very first moments in hell your very first moments, I want to tell you what to expect. Because just the law of probability, mathematics, says not everyone in this room is going to heaven. Not everyone in this room is going to heaven. Not everyone online watching is going to heaven. Just the parables of Jesus teach us that. So I want you to know when you get there what to expect. So you know, your very first few moments, you'll know what to expect. You will yearn for water. You will desire water so bad. This is what the Bible says. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Your first moments in hell, you will desire water so bad. I don't know if you've ever ran far. I don't know if you've ever been so dehydrated where you just start to chug water. You won't even desire just a bottle of water. You'll just desire a drop of water. A fingertip drop of water just to stop the torment. And there will never be water to stop the torment. There won't be water. You'll never stop the torment. I know people don't ever teach you this and people don't preach this, but it is the truth of God's word. This man ended up in hell, and this is what the Bible says. I believe the Bible to be true. And this man just said, I just want him to dip his finger in the water 
and just bring it to me. I don't know if you've been dehydrated, that wouldn't do much. I don't know if you ran a race and think that that would do anything. But when you're in that much torment, that much agony, that much pain, that much suffering, you will yearn for water and never be satisfied. It'd be foolish of us to think everyone we know is going to heaven. It'd be foolish to think every funeral we go to, everyone is going to heaven. It'd be foolish to think everyone in our immediate family may be going to heaven. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But just what Jesus teaches, it does say, the wheat and the tares will grow together. Jesus said, I'm going to throw a net. I'm going to start separating the good from the bad. There's the story of the ten virgins and the bridegroom. The bride was coming in. The bridegroom was coming in those ten virgins. Five were ready and five were not. To think everyone is going to heaven is absolutely absurd. It goes against the very word of God. It goes against everything the Bible says. And I want you to know this because one day you need to know the truth. And one day you'll say, I heard the truth. And you will yearn for water. But how many know The fourth thing is I love when they put this on cemetery plots and they put this on gravestones. Rest in peace. You'll be so tired, there is no rest. There's no sleep. There's no peace, there's no relaxation. You will never find rest again. You will never find relaxation again. It's not rest and relaxation. It's not like you go through it for a few months and then eventually you get a few weekends off. It's forever and ever and ever the torment, the fire, the, the screaming, the crying, the gnashing of teeth. There's no rest. You'll be perpetually with no peace and no rest. You'll be so tired, so ex exhausted. You'll be so tormented. There'll be no rest, there'll be no peace. The thing that gets me the most is you'll be so afraid The enemy always loves to use fear. You'll be so afraid. You'll see things you never expected. You'll hear things you could not imagine. You will be so afraid. I'm just talking about your first few moments in hell. Just the first few moments. First few minutes. Fear will grip you in a way that you could not even imagine. Fear will grab you in ways you could not even think are possible. You'll be so afraid, you will be so afraid. God's protection is not in hell. There's no hedge of protection around you in hell. Even people now that are living outside of God's will, I'm grateful for God's protection even when you're not serving him. But that protection is gone in hell. There's no protection in hell. It's a place of utter damnation, torment, gnashing of the teeth, wailing and crying like you could not believe.
There will be murderers in hell, rapists in hell, dictators in hell. You'll be so afraid. Fear will grip you in a way that you could not imagine. The fear will bring you to the point of destruction, but leave you just on the edge of it. Because if you could be destroyed, it'd probably be the best thing. But you will live there forever. There is no exit from hell. There's no do-over. There's no transfer. There's not, if you try, try, and try again, maybe you could get it right. Maybe if you do good for a hundred years, you could get promoted to heaven. There's a million ways into hell, but there's not one way out of hell. There's no exits. There's no do-over. There's no, let me see if I could get it right. Let me see if I could serve good for a hundred years. It's impossible. Once you're there, you're there. I'm just talking about your very first few moments, your first few minutes in hell. You will look for a way out, and there is no way out. You'll be there forever and ever and ever. And it says that, and besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor those from there pass to us. You will hear the songs of suffering. You will hear weeping. You will hear crying in such a way. You will hear teeth just gnashing. There's no way out. Once you're there, you're there. The Bible says in John 3, 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who did not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Matthew 10, 28 says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Revelation 21, 8 says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual, immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. There's no way out once you get there. The great thing is there's only one way to heaven. The great thing is we know the way. The great thing is we have the solution. We have the answer. The great thing is if you will humble yourself and say, I don't know everything. And you say, Jesus, I put my faith in you. I put my hope in you. I put my trust in you. I give you everything. You can spend eternity with Jesus in heaven. But if you say, I know it all. I got it together. I see many people I've talked to, I've talked to family members, I've talked to loved ones, I've talked to people that I've known for many years. And when you start to talk to them about Jesus, they've heard it all. But we keep trying and we keep telling them. But maybe they need to be told This is what your first moments in hell will be like. If you don't make Jesus your savior, if you're not born again, I'm here to tell you, there's a million ways into hell. There's no way out. Once you're there, you're there. There's no do-overs. There's no, I'm just going to be resilient and push through. There's no pushing through in hell. There's no resiliency that can get you through hell. 
Once you're there, you're there. There's no way out. No one has promised tomorrow. It'd be foolish to think everyone in this room is going to heaven. It'd be foolish to think everyone online is going to heaven. Jesus taught so different. One day Jesus will come back. The Bible calls it that eastern sky will crack open. There'll be a shout. That trumpet will sound. But I'm here to tell you, if you die before he comes back and he's not Lord and Savior of your life, I just wanted you to know what your first few moments in hell will be like. So right now, let's all stand. I pray this word lands on good soil tonight. Hell is a real place. I know we're not taught that anymore in the body of Christ. But that's why there's no urgency for souls. That's why we're more worried about church games than reaching the lost. Because hell's not a real place. Heaven's not a real place. It's just a figment of our imagination. Let me tell you, heaven is real. And if heaven is real, the Bible talks about hell 10 times more. Hell's a real place. Right now, bow your head, close your eyes to Jesus. If you're not sure you're going to heaven don't leave here without being positive but you have free will you could reject this message but then you can know what to expect when you end up in hell you can reject the word you know what to expect your first few moments when you get there Or you can let the word lay on good soil in your heart and say, I'm choosing Jesus. I'm putting my faith in Jesus, my hope in Jesus. I'm giving my life to Jesus. Friends come and go. People come and go. The wheat and the tares will grow together. The people you're hanging out with now, not all of them will make it to heaven. Be foolish to think that. But you can choose life today. You will spend eternity somewhere. That is the truth. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you want to give your life to Jesus, be 100% sure you're going to heaven. I'm not going to count to three. When I say lift your hand, just lift it. If you want to give your life to Jesus and know you'll spend eternity with Jesus, just lift your hand now. Lift it up, lift it up, lift it up. Be sure. Lift it high. Lift it high. Lift it high. I see hands going up all over. Lift it up. Lift it up. If you're not sure, I'm going to give you a few more moments. Lift it up. 
Let it fall on good soil. I wanted the youth in here tonight because 80% of people that are Christians got saved before the age of 20. And the older they get, the percentage just goes down. God's doing something in our youth. So right now, if you want to be sure, lift your hand high. Keep it up. 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 If you have your hand lifted, get down here. I want to pray for you. Be bold. Come down here. Hurry. give it a little more time if you want to come down here if you want to be sure and give your heart to Jesus get down here don't waste be ready come down we'll wait on you we'll wait on you come on let's just sing something we'll give you a couple more minutes turn. needs to come down. Come down. We want to wait for you. We're going to wait for one or two more people that just feel led right now to wait. We're not going to rush this. If you need to get up here, we're giving you time. Be bold right now. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, everyone, lift chance. Everyone that came down front, lift your hands. That's here at the altar, down here at this area, lift your hands pray for you. This is the greatest thing you'll ever do. Even if you're here today and you didn't come forward, you will remember this word forever. I speak that into your life call to you in the middle of the night. Everyone lift your hands up here. And repeat after me. Do it boldly. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I repent. I give you my life. I give you everything. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. 
I surrender to you, Jesus. You are the Lord. You are the God of heaven and earth. I will worship you. I will serve you all the days of my life. I give you my heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on. Now stay up here. Lift your hands. I just want to bless each person that came up here. Great boldness. Great boldness. Allie, why don't you just pray for them right now? Bless them. Jesus, you came to seek and save that which was lost. Your heart bleeds for the souls of mankind. You died on that cross for each and every one of us. And so now we stretch our hands as a church towards these that have boldly come forward to receive you tonight. They have shunned hell and gained heaven. And so now we break every chain of the enemy, every lie of the enemy, every scheme of the enemy, every tormenting thought, any anxiety, any depression, any addiction, anything that has ever hindered them. And we know tonight that they are made new and you, Jesus, that they leave this place a new creation, a new creation, one that your spirit that the very life of God invades them. We declare over every young one, over every young one that the devil can't have them and tonight they know that they know that they know they are yours, Jesus. We declare over every man, over every woman, and over every child that they are blood bought and blood washed in their destiny that is being that is being born tonight at this altar and your purpose, your purpose, why you were plucked out of eternity and placed on this earth is now to be fishers of men. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You're so winners now. You've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb and now you have purpose on the inside of you. You're aware that hell is real. You're aware that heaven is real. And now you can bring as many people with you to heaven. So bless them, Jesus, in Jesus' name. Now, as they say up here, if you have a burden for souls to be a soul winner, come down to these altars and surround these people. Get to the left and the right. Hurry, hurry. I want to pray for you because we need soul winners in the kingdom. I believe these people that just gave their life to Jesus are going to be great soul winners. Just gather in. It's all right. Come on, sing it again, Victoria.
you go to Indonesia, you go to Africa, you go to Central America, you go to South America, you go to downtown LA, you go to Whittier, you go to La Habra, you go wherever the Lord leads you, your workplace, your family reunion, and you will be a light in the darkness because heaven is real and hell is real. And God will make it plain to you and stamp it on your heart and on your spirit from this day forth. You understand the gnashing of teeth. You understand the torments. You understand there is no window. They will desire to be in the worst situation here on earth, but there'll be a greater desire in you to see souls enter the kingdom of heaven. And I pray for a fresh fire to enter your heart and your mind right now in Jesus' name. And everyone say amen. Let's just worship God together. God is good. I pray that the Lord spoke to you today, and I believe that God is moving in our midst. I want you to right now consider praying for the end time harvest, praying for souls to be saved, praying for lives to be changed, praying for nations to come to know Jesus. We'll also pray about partnering with us. We're looking for monthly support. We're looking for a one-time gift. We're looking for someone that says, I want to pray, pay for an entire crusade. As you're praying about that, I believe God's going to speak to you. We can't outgive God. And I pray that God makes you a river of blessing. That as you bless the kingdom, God just keeps giving you more. As you keep blessing, God gives you more. As you keep blessing, God gives you more. This is good soil and you must get seed in the soil. And for your harvest to grow in your life, you have to put seed in the soil. The easiest way not to get a harvest is put no seed in the ground. This is a good place to put a seed in. Right now, consider partnering with us on any amount that you get seed in the soil to see the harvest of souls come into the kingdom of God. I just bless you. I declare the best is yet to come and God is gonna bring abundance and overflow to your life this year in Jesus' name. Amen.